look at union membership first, because obviously that's in the context. And I think points already been made. No pay, poor jobs, usually the absence of a trade union. Of course, we don't stay. And in fact, if we look at the European countries and we were to, to look at the relationship between low pay and union membership, union density, we find a very close relationship. So the lower the density, the higher the group with the proportion of low pay people, there, particularly in the private sector. And 97% of low pay people are in the private sector, 3% are in the public sector. So it's the private sector, and as we know, union membership has shrunk in the private sector. It has maintained itself to some extent in the public sector. So it really is a, an issue about union membership and about trade union reach and trade union presence. And the big problem for trade unions is shrinking in the private sector. Is this? Which one do I press? The right one. Right. So if we look at density, between 1925 and 2011, you can see that in 1925 it was at 21%, and it has gone up, reached its height in 1980, there about 20, 65%, 66%, and it has shrunk back down to around 32, 33% in 2011. Now that's all membership, and that includes the public sector. So when we look at the private sector, it's down to about 20%, one in five. That's the issue about low pay. If you look at the United States, over the last 30 years, the growth in low pay, the growth in inequality has been substantial. And they have a very low unionization rate. And they're looking for all kinds of mechanisms to try and improve the low pay area. But nobody has come across a better mechanism than unions. <coughs> and that's the public and private sector density rates. And you can see that in 2008, as I say, the private sector is down to about 21%, and union density in the public sector is around 75 76%. So there's a huge gap that presents a problem. And the issue then is, why is this gap there? Why is unionisation so high in the public sector and low in the private sector? Now, there have been many explanations for this. And, uh, academics get away living out of that because we produce loads of papers about why the factors that determine that. And there are always disagreements about what are the factors. Is it because we've shifted from white collar, blue collar to white collar work? Is it because we've left behind the old smokestack industries and now we have these high technology industries? Is it because occupations are now more professional and skilled and educated than in the past? Now all of these factors have been trotted out. But there is a major problem with them. If we look at some of the more advanced economies like, say, Sweden, we find that union density, both in the private sector and the public sector, is well above 70%. It's around about the same percentage as our public sector, if not higher. Denmark's the same. They have very uh, high-skilled, highly educated, well-developed economies. So that factor then doesn't count. It's something else that's... that's uh, that's affecting density rates. And by the way, just as an aside, because Sheila mentioned it earlier, she said there's not many, very many females here. Have a look at the density rates in Ireland, have they changed? And it's astonishing. Very few people realise that 56% of union members are now female. 46% are male. It doesn't reflect itself in what's happening in the union movement, and there's a problem. And you can see. That is a peak growth in the period 1994 to 2012. Now, there's a lot of factors to account for that. But nevertheless, the bald fact is that there's more females in Irish trade unions than males. Quite a change. And you and I have been really surprised, I think. <laughs> yeah, okay, I've said that. Now, one of the factors that people try out is, well, people don't really want you. There's no demand. That's another factor besides all these other things about occupation change. And this is using a European Social Survey, which is quite stable across all of the European countries. And what we find is, if you look at these, if you read off the figures, uh, people are asked, do you need, do people, employees need strong unions uh, to protect their working conditions? And you can see that 
employees, 77%, even the self-employed, 64%, which surprised me. And those not at work, as you can imagine, they are even more strong on that. So overall, we have a percentage of 78% agreeing with this, the need for strong trade unions. And you can see it's a tiny percentage that disagrees. So why the low unionization rate? And one of the factors, of course, that we would put forward, it's not the only one, but it's a very important one, is that unions are not able to get out there and establish themselves in the private sector. As you all know, they're all union members. Unions, are they welcomed with open arms? They're not. They have to struggle to establish themselves. And there are other issues besides what I'm going to look at union recognition. There's issues about union activists, people getting involved, organising, getting out there. But I would say, and it's something I was thinking about recently, of all the areas in Irish life, we live in a democracy, it's a long-term democracy. There's one area where discrimination occurs, where fear exists, where anxiety exists, where pressure exists. It's in the workplace when people say, I'm in the union. It's astonishing. You can go out and you can talk about anything else, about disability, immigration, quite rightly, but you're not going to get the same negative backwash that you get from either being a union member or being involved or supporting the union. It's quite astonishing. I find it one of the few areas that the Liberals have actually parked and left behind in the workplace. And so all the other arenas in democracy are fine. You're entitled to say what you like, you're, you're supported, you're legally protected. But when you get into the workplace, that's not the case. I find that quite astonishing. So it is not an easy thing to be involved in the union, in particularly in the, in the private sector. The public sector is different because government sees unions as legitimate organisations, whereas in the private sector, they don't. And it's a struggle, and it's hostility. And people's jobs can be on the line, their careers, what's going to happen to them over time. That's no easy thing. I don't know if any of you read recently about in England, about a consultancy company. There was a case brought by a couple of hundred uh, union members. A consultancy company since the 1970s had been keeping records of about 3,000 union activists. And these were circulated to different companies. So their lives, their careers, their jobs were stunted. And the case they're taking is some of them spent years unemployed because they couldn't get the work. So it's not an easy deal, it's difficult, it's struggle. So in that context, union recognition becomes a key issue. And I'm going to look at some of the key aspects of that. But also I want to look at the present, what's happening at the present. I'm pretty appalled at what's happening at the present, and what's going to happen, and what looks like it's going to happen. And, okay, so employer opposition is a key factor, we would say, one of the key factors in the decline in unionisation in the private sector. Okay, the routes to union recognition in the past was, first of course, was the obvious industrial dispute. There's no, first of all, as we all know, we have a right to association under the Constitution. We do not have an equal right to representation. So we have a half right. You can join a union, but you don't have a right for that union to go in and represent you, which is, as I, as I can tell, a half right. Uh, we have referred to the Labour Court on the Industrial Relations Act 1969, which was the most common route and the Labour Court would issue a recommendation and usually issued a recommendation for the company to recognise a union and from research done by Paddy and, uh, and others we find that very few of these recommendations are ever acted on. In other words, the union is not recognised. More recently we have the Industrial Relations Amendment Act 2001 and amended in 2004. These were not specifically did not specifically allow union recognition. They were, to, to, you've come across the industrial base and many of you may have even been working them. But it didn't allow for union recognition or collective bargaining. 
it's just an error representation where there was no collective bargaining and there was inadequate dispute resolution procedures. And if the Labour Court what got involved in a case under the Act, it could recommend that certain conditions of employment be put in place, certain disputes procedures. It could not recommend collective bargaining, and it certainly could recommend union recognition. It was outside the scope of the Act. And explicitly states in the Act that it is outside the scope. Okay. We all know the famous Ryanair case. And initially, in this case, I think it was 2005, the Labour Court received an application from the Impact Trade Union on behalf of pilot members to bring a case against Ryanair under the Industrial Relations Amendment Act. In other words, their argument was that there was no collective bargaining and there was no proper disputes mechanisms and they couldn't discuss their terms and conditions of employment. Now, Ryanair's response to the Labour Court was that they did in fact have a collective bargaining and they used this concept of an accepted body. I don't know if you've come across the term accepted body. Yeah, it's okay. a very important term that's locked inside the 1941 Act and various other industrial relations Act. And the accepted body, uh, it, it's defined here, if you look at the definition, which is very important, it says a body of members employed by the same employer carries on negotiations on the fixing of wages of conditions with, with, uh, of its own members, with the employer. So it's something inside the company. And, of course, we would always see the accepted body as an internal union, a yellow pack union, company union, as they call them in, in the United States. Um, Ryanair's position was that the Labour Court didn't have the jurisdiction to investigate under the Industrial Relations Amendments Act because character bargaining was going on already with the pilots in Ryanair. Now you've heard of the employee, through what they call the Employee Representative Councils. They've been in the news recently. The Employee Representative Councils, set up by Ryanair, staffed basically by Ryanair, and the pilots withdrew from that. Nevertheless, Ryanair claimed that they were carrying on collective bargaining. Now, some of these issues are going to service later on and are servicing again, but the Labour Court said that the Employment Representative Councils were not an accepted body, in other words, and the reason why they gave was that they weren't really carrying on genuine collective bargaining in any case. Even if it was a company union, it didn't even reach the level where it collected on and where they carried out real negotiations. And it concluded that they could actually investigate. And this was the beginning of the process which led to the Supreme Court. And because Ryanair, as usual, they always take a legal case. Every time anything happens, Ryanair reach for the legal case. So they brought it to the Supreme Court. First of all, of course, it went to the High Court. And in the High Court, the High Court judge, described Ryanair as a very hostile, a very exploitative employer, and in fact upheld the Labour Court. So they appealed it to the Supreme Court, and when it was heard in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court actually supported Ryanair's case, and it supported the case that the Employee Representative Council were an accepted body, and I'll draw the implications of that in a moment, that the machinery for collective bargaining was in place at ad hoc, and not ad hoc, that they did actually have collective bargaining machinery. And uh, that's sufficient to support Ryanair's argument. Now, there were major problems with how they defined collective bargaining. How did the Supreme Court define collective bargaining? Does anybody know, by the way, did anybody read the judgment? The Supreme Court took out a dictionary and they looked up what collective bargaining meant. They didn't ask any trade unions. They didn't even ask the Labour Court. They didn't even go to the ILO. They just looked up the dictionary. And they said, collective bargaining, 
then that's what Brian Air do. They also said in their judgment, the collective bargaining doesn't necessarily have to look like it does in a unionized environment, which is even worse. So, so this was the judgment. Now the implications, and I draw these out quickly, of what an accepted body is, of what the collective bargaining is, and the statutory right to recognition. An accepted body. Now, I've drawn out the implications here. This is both what the Supreme Court judgment said about the accepted body and also the implications of its judgment. So, for example, an accepted body can only exist or be established at the behest of the employer because who else can sell an internal mechanism except the employer themselves? So it can't be set up by the employees. It doesn't require a negotiation license. The Supreme Court said nothing about that. There's no verification procedures that it actually exists. It does what it says it does. The Supreme Court didn't look for any empirical evidence from Ryanair. It didn't go in and say, who's on the employee representative councils? How does it actually go about discussing issues? It just said, that's okay, it's an accepted body. Uh, it doesn't require the consent or participation of the company employees, believe it or not, because the Ryanair pilots walked out of the employee representative council and said that they weren't engaging because it wasn't genuine negotiations. The Supreme Court said that's not a reason to say that it isn't collective family. Now that's, that's their, their view. So even if employees say we're boycotting, mechanism. It's still regarded as a genuine collective bargaining mechanism. Um, so it's of no consequence the continuation of the body. Now it's quite substantial. They are quite incredible actually. And uh, they're hardly even a yellow pack union. It hardly even reaches the level of a company union. Now what we argued was that the, the accepted body it's an indigenous version of a company union. It's in breach of the, the International Labour Organization. Convention 98, which the government ratified in 1955, states what collective bargaining is, by the way. They can only got to go to a treaty that they signed up to. It states what collective bargaining is, and it states what, who can carry out collective bargaining. And we find that in Canada and the United States, for example, such unions are illegal. And now we have them, they're legal in Ireland. Um, it's an interference with the right of association. So, the ILO Convention is very clear, and what it's very clear about, and the reason I want to make this very clear, it's, a, it's an important point, because we come to it in recent times, this point has become confused again. The ILO states that the only body that can carry out collective bargaining is an independent trade union. Nobody else can carry out collective bargaining. Collective bargaining and independent trade unions are inextricably intertwined. You can't have one without the other. It's, it's, a, it's a misnomer. It's an oxymoron if you don't have one without the other. Because collective bargaining means you need an organisation that's going to bargain for you on your behalf and it has to be independent of the trade union or the employer. Okay. Collective bargaining, where well, I talked about the, the I've already made that uh, statement. Again, the ILO, we're signed up to the ILO, we're signed up to Convention 98, there's a definition of collective bargaining which the Supreme Court failed to, I don't know why they didn't use it. Perhaps they didn't have any research and who understood that it was actually in existence. It was never explained. It's incredible. It is incredible. I don't think they used any way to research this. And they were actually, and continue to be in breach of their ILO. Constitutional issue, by the way, in the judgment, this was just an aside, a casual. You can't have a law facilitating union recognition. Now, that's quite incredible, by the way, because there's a law facilitating union recognition in, even in the United States, draconian as it is. There's one in Canada, which is also constitutional 
uh, governed country. So again, this seems to be something of a property right so that the employer has the right, right the employee has the right to join a union, the employer has the right not to recognise in some way this is supposed to be seen as um, anyway. Uh, and they said that there couldn't be a law passed compelling an employer to recognise a union. Again, unprecedented. Um, anyway, I mentioned that. The present situation. Now, this is where I really get worked up. <laughs> this comes from an article which Michelle passed on to me, written in the Industrial Relations News. Now, the article, the writer, the author is, is quite accurate in what, what they're putting down here. They're reporting the views of the trade unions and other people, employers and trade unions, on the present situation. Now, as you know, at present, there is pressure from the trade unions for the Labour Party to bring in a bill. That's going to come up shortly. There's supposed to be, I think, a, there's a report to come out, isn't there, quite shortly about this issue. Now, it too, this is what's reported in the article. I'll just give it to the, the important parts. Irish Congress Trade Union's position in the collective bargaining is that external decisions like the ILO and the, the, the European Court of Human Rights supersede the Irish law, such as the ILO Convention should supersede it. The implication of that is that trade union, that there's a, a, a right to have collective bargaining and union recognition. That's the position. So this scenario promises not just collective bargaining, but outright trade union recognition. Now remember what I said before, by the way. There's a confusion here already. This gets worse in supporting union officials. They're confusing as if you could have collective bargaining without union recognition. So we're back to this. You can have collective bargaining without an independent trade union, which translates into you can have collective bargaining with a company union. That's really what's getting back to, and that's where we're going. So, I, I just before just something that strikes me, and I must say it, you would even find that there is evidence to suggest that employers are using instruments like the. Um, the uh, information consultation forums. Mm. Um, like I, I know of at least one multinational who, who more or less created the environment whereby the union went looking for an uh, information consultation forum and was forced to hand them up for it to deal with these labour industrial relations issues. Mm. But it's clear, and I'm very clear what their intention is. Yeah. Their intention is to put that in place, chop the legs off the union, so we have an accepted it's a company place, and, and, and and the sooner we wake up to that fact, mm. yeah, the better. Absolutely. This is the confusion that's coming in, and it's reflected in some of these comments from the unions themselves. So, uh, this is from City Vice President Patricia King. It says that trade unions need to find a definition of collective bargaining that does not allow for employer dominance of workplace representative bodies. Now, again, it's a bit confusing because it's saying mm, there's employer representative, employee representative bodies or uh, body set up with the employer that somehow will have a status and that's where we're getting back to uh, and the article goes on to say that this objective could now tie into the approach likely to be adopted by the minister which is they're going to focus on setting down rules for collective bargaining that allows accepted bodies back in that allows company unions essentially allows collective bargaining to be carried out or something other than a trade union. And this seems to be the drift towards what's going to be accepted. It's a compromise, as seen as a compromise, that somehow they can involve a definition of collective barrier that will grant internal employees a degree of independence that will pass most of it the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. That's in the article. That's from the, the trade union officials, by the way. I did say who. So, <laughs> so what you've got is a slippage back into the accepted body in the company union. Whereas they should be saying collective bargaining only occurs in dependent trade unions. The two should be seen as linked together without any separation. If there's any move on that, you're going backwards. And 
the essence that most of the union officials that were reporting their opinions were reported back in this article seemed to be that they want to get mend the features of the 2001 and 4 acts, get them back into working. But that would mean ex having an accepted body in certain companies. So Ryanair is grand. There will never be a union in Ryanair. There will never be a union anywhere where the employer decides to set up a body which allows the employees to so-called negotiate. That's where we're at. And I think this, I can't believe when I read this guy, because it's just reporting on the, the opinions of people that it had moved back to this type of thing. So if you look at the first one, sorry, the, the original IC2 position was the correct position, and it's that slipping as I went down through the article, and now it's sort of saying, well, we've got to have compromise, and we've got to. I don't think there should be any compromise. I fail to see how you can compromise. No, I mean, it's like, it's not as long as you can't have one or the other. I mean, it's strictly linked to you. You know, you can't get But that's not the view of many... Well, 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 well maybe, maybe, it's the, maybe it's the job of the people, some of the people there tonight to um, make sure that that is the view that goes back up the line on the trade union movement with plenty of people yeah. uh, that would, would, would uh, do that, you know. Um, so, I mean, that, I, that, that's actually on track to... That's where it's drifting back. And in fact, what really should be solved is a very simple amendment. Take the word accepted body out of the 1941 and 42 Acts. In fact, they're all consolidated now in the 2011 Act. Take it out of the Consolidated Act. Just amend it and say, take out the clause that refers to an accepted body. That's the problem. If you take out that clause, you can't have a company union then everything else would fall into place. It's very basic. And it would be more in line with the uh, ILO, Convention 98. Even aside from trying to get union recognition, forget about it. This is going backwards. This is allowing the possibility for company unions to have a huge level of legitimacy. And that's where it's at. So if any of you have any influence, <laughs> you could bring it up. But certainly, it's, it's a I'm appalled at it. Yes, yeah, so the union should be better going into this. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a key issue. Better to say to the Labour Party, even, don't bother doing anything, than start going back to legitimising these accepted bodies. In fact, the union room should be looking to delete that trust, accepted body. Say that to start with concerns. Yes. Because simple, paper in strengths, and employee the representative council. Representative form employees. Yeah. It doesn't have an independent union. Yeah. That's that's the same thing. And these are appointed by Central. Yeah. Yeah, same same idea. The employer yeah. points and of course the pressures on people then and who's going to be in these kind of bodies. And in fact, on the employee representative councils in Ryanair, interestingly enough, they have a website, you know, be fair to Ryanair or whatever. I don't know if any of you have ever been on it. It's interesting to go on because they chat to each other on the website. And this website, after the Supreme Court judgment, it ran a survey of uh, people in Ryanair. And it particularly asked the people who sat on employee representative council to answer the survey. And the results are very instructive because most, the vast majority, said that they were appointed, not elected, that they had no powers, that they were told what to do. So that the so if, if we say Congress have said now that the uh, European Court of Human Rights supersedes any decision by the Supreme Court in this case, why are we still stuck with it if that's the case? And another question I'd like to ask you is regards representation. Mm. Somebody in trouble uh, uh, in a local factory or whatever and uh, invited to a disciplinary meeting, bring a colleague with you, this has no training whatsoever. Where's the national justice and fair procedures in that? Mm -hmm. And has to be in breach of statutory instrument one two six four one two six of two thousand yes yeah? one four six. So the point I'm making is, mm -hmm. are you deprived natural justice and the company allowed it under the law? 
set the, the payment arrangements. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to take, as you said, you made a vote for a thousand cases from uh, CE from C2? Why one? Why not one? Mm -hmm. For breaking it on, that's it. It applies to everybody. 